Okay, let's talk about homeostasis in this short video. Uh, homeostasis is this dynamic state of change, right? It's keeping the seesaw tilting in one way and then finding a way to bring it back the other way. And we have these two feedback loops, negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. Most of the feedback loops in the human body are negative feedback loops. There are very, very few positive feedback loops. We'll talk about these a little bit more on the discussion board, but negative feedback loops are pretty common. This is when, uh, let's say you're running and you're out of breath and your heart rate is beating really fast and then you stop exercising, how in a very, very short period of time in a few minutes, your heart rate comes back down and your respirations per minute come back down. It kind of brings you back to an opposite type of um, internal situation. If your blood sugar goes up, then it finds a way to bring it back down. That's a negative feedback loop. Positive feedback loops are bringing on the same type of scenario, meaning a woman's in pain during labor because of the smooth muscle contraction of the uh, myometrium of the uterus and the constant bombardment of oxytocin. So the more oxytocin, the more pain, the more pain, it stimulates more oxytocin. That's a positive feedback loop. You would think that if a woman is experiencing discomfort and pain during labor, that the pain would make the body shut it off so you're feeling more comfortable. But this is one of the instances where the po in a positive feedback loop, you're thinking of childbirth, like labor. More oxytocin, more pain. More pain, more oxytocin. More oxytocin, more pain. The only time it ever stops is after delivery. Okay, that's a positive feedback loop. Now, there's another um, positive feedback loop that in terms of clotting, right? If someone gets stabbed or shot and they're losing blood, there's turbulent blood flow, the body's going to start clotting and clotting and clotting and clotting until a clot is formed so they don't bleed to death. That's another positive feedback loop. It brings on more fibrin and more clotting and more calcium, more prothrombin, all of that stuff to create a clot so you don't bleed to death. But there are some instances in which this positive feedback loop can actually hurt people. And that's when, let's say they have uh, a little bit of a blockage of an artery to begin with due to oxidized LDL, oxidized cholesterol, damaged cholesterol, smoking, drinking, alcohol, poor lifestyle, and all of a sudden, due to the constriction of blood flow, the body perceives that there's blood loss only because the blood is flowing through a given area of a blood vessel turbulently. The body perceives turbulent blood flow as blood loss, like a stab or a gunshot wound, so it wants to clot it. And this is what causes many types of strokes and heart attacks, right? That's a positive feedback loop. Here's another feedback loop, right? This is a negative feedback loop. Here, we're talking about the connection between the thyroid and the parathyroid gland. So if you look at number one on the top left there, here we're looking, it says high levels of calcium in the blood stimulates the thyroid parafollicular cells to release calcitonin. Now, calcitonin is designed to take the high amounts of calcium in your blood in circulation and take that calcium and put it in the bone or to urinate out some of that extra calcium, right? But either way, if you're urinating out some calcium, that's going to lower the amount of calcium in the blood. And if there's too much calcium in blood, you can actually find a way to put it in bone. That lowers the amount of calcium in blood. That's what calcitonin does. So you can see from number two that high level of calcium goes to number two, goes to the thyroid where calcitonin is released, and it inhibits osteoclasts. So what do osteoclasts do? Remember osteoblast, build up bone, osteoclast, breakdown bone. Well, if you're breaking down bone, you're increasing the amount of calcium in your blood. But this says it inhibits osteoclast. So it's shutting down the breakdown of bone, decreasing the amount of blood in the calcium, 
the, uh, decreasing the amount of blood calcium levels. So then you follow that green arrow back up to number three, and if there was too much calcitonin and the levels of blood calcium dipped too much, now that's going to stimulate the chief cells of the parathyroid gland to release parathyroid hormone. You can see number three, the parathyroids are on that posterior portion of the thyroid. And it's PTH is going to promote the release of calcium from the bone. It's going to shut off calcium loss from urine. Okay, so calcitonin is designed to decrease the amount of calcium in the blood. And parathyroid is designed to increase the amount of calcium in the blood. That's a negative feedback loop. Okay. So here you can see that in order for parathyroid hormone to work, in this case, remember PTH is trying to increase the amount of calcium in blood. So we can use the bones right in the middle, the bones, we can use the digestive tract. And we can use the kidneys, right? We can use three different parts of the body, the bone, the digestive tract, and the kidneys to affect calcium. So if we're trying to increase the amount of calcium in the blood, we can use the bone by breaking down bone. So this is osteoclasts. It activates the osteoclast to increase the amount of calcium. Now, Parathyroid hormone can affect the intestines. It can say, hey, intestines, we want to absorb more calcium from the digestive tract. And how do we do that? Well, vitamin D is involved in increasing calcium absorption. That's why the kidneys are involved in two ways. Number one, it can activate vitamin D, which helps us absorb more calcium and it increases calcium reabsorption at the kidneys. It prevents calcium loss from urination. Okay, another good uh, negative feedback loop. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about the adrenal glands in a little bit more detail.